In this video, I'd like to introduce you to the idea of compile to JavaScript, the idea that we might take a program that might be written in any language, actually including JavaScript, put it through some kind of a compiler and produce, instead of machine code or Java byte code, but produce JavaScript for running in the browser. I'd like to explain why we might want to do this and how this relates to the single page apps, the client side apps that you'll be producing in your uh, tutorials and in your assignment. I'm going to start with a kind of a historical perspective. So HTML and JavaScript are fairly old. Uh, the web's been around since around about 1993, and the web has lots and lots and lots of backwards compatibility uh, requirements. So just because we've updated our browser this year doesn't mean that we necessarily want to stop being able to view web pages that were written even 20 years ago. And this then means that browsers still today have to support some of the practices, uh, some of the practices of old, the way that people used to write web pages uh, in years gone by, but they don't necessarily do so now. So I'm going to pop to a quick demo. Uh, so this is a very, very simple HTML file. Uh, file. It's just got the doc type declaration at the top, uh, the HTML tags and two paragraphs. And this is running on a server on my laptop. So none of these requests are going to leave my computer. They're all, they're all local to this machine. And let's start off. Let's just load that file. And there it is. And now what I'd like to do, I'm going to insert a script element. And the script element I'm going to insert is going to say document.write of I was inserted. If I save that and I now hit refresh, you'll see that I was inserted from that JavaScript does indeed come between the two paragraphs. Uh, what this means is that the browser, when it's parsing the HTML, when it hits this script, it wants to execute the script. And it, it can't really go on and parse and prepare the rest of the page until it's done, uh, done that. Because for instance, what I might have done is I might have uh, put a an open pre element there and I might then have another script a little bit lower down that closes that pre element that means that this second paragraph is now going to be nested inside an element that was uh, introduced from the JavaScript and so there we go the font uh, looks a little bit a uh, little bit different because it's now inside a pre element and if we go to the inspector, there it is, the three tags around uh, that second paragraph. That's all well and good while the script is directly in line in the HTML. Suppose, however, it wasn't. Suppose instead we had script source equals uh, my script dot js. Uh, so my script.js just does the same. It just says document.write and inserted. And let's refresh the page. And so in this case, not only does it have to run the script, it has to fetch the script. It's got to make an HTTP request in order to get that script and execute it before it can finish um, working out what to show on the page. And so let's let's clear the uh, go to the timeline here. And let's set this recording and let's hit refresh and stop it recording. And so this is in Chrome's developer tools and I've just got it. So it just shows the uh, the loading event. But so if we zoom in on that part of the timeline, you should be able to see it sends the first request to get the page, receives the response, receives the data, it's finished loading the page and now it's got to parse the HTML. And inside that parse, it has to send this request. And uh, then we see here that uh, the, the response is finish, finished loading and the parse HTML continues. But you can see there's a bit of a gap here. There's a gap from a bit after 1900 milliseconds to a bit after uh, 2000 milliseconds. So that there is almost a, um, there, there, there is almost a hundred millisecond gap because of needing to load that script in order to finish uh, displaying the page, even though that request never left this computer, that was, that request was just local to, to this machine. And if you can imagine, we could um, 
we might not just have one script in there. We might have, uh, well, we, we might have two or we might have a dozen scripts in there, in which case we're going to see uh, delays while our, um, <clears throat> So we're going to end up seeing delays while our scripts are loaded. Now, in this case, these two requests can get sent off in parallel and they're to the local machine. So they'll come back at this around about the same time. But you can see that that, uh, that, that, that delay there, that's looking a little bit longer that time. It's looking like uh, 120 milliseconds. Suppose instead we went to a site that had a bit more on it. Suppose we went to bbc.co.uk. Now, this is a very media heavy um, site. But if we look at the number of requests that are in this particular page, so let's hit refresh, we can see there's lots of them just scrolling down, still scrolling. Most of them are for images, but some of them are going to end up being for uh, for JavaScript. There's some JavaScript uh, there. That one, that one, in fact, failed. Uh, there's another uh, another piece of JavaScript that's being loaded, and if we look at the timeline on this. It looks as if that page took around about 10 seconds to load. Quite a long time because it's needing to make quite so many requests. Um, let's pull up one that is um, uh, kind of here's one I made earlier. This is a little app that I've written that I use in another course in Comp 284. And in here we can see that, uh, well, they, there's still quite a few requests, but they, there's sort of not nearly so many and it loads in about two seconds. So the number of requests that go on a page really do does make quite a big, big difference. Now, that was because we were doing all this document.write, uh, etc. into the scripts. But well, people don't really do that very much anymore. Um, that's sort of not how uh, modern use of JavaScript goes. It's, it's an old practice that browsers still need to support. Uh, but so it means that loading a page, the browser loads the HTML, begins parsing it, it encounters the script, needs to fetch the script, parse it, run it, and continue parsing the HTML. And that means there's a delay before your page is ready to be displayed. There was an old bit of advice. Perhaps one solution to this would be, what if we put all our script tags at the bottom of the page so that, well, all of the, all of the actual interesting HTML was above it and it's already been parsed and it's already been displayed at the point at which our scripts are fetched. And sure enough, that, that used to help some people's sites, but it doesn't solve the whole problem because, uh, well, with modern systems, we actually need the JavaScript in order for the page to function. And so it still means that, well, until it's all happened, you don't have a functional page yet. Um, but it's also because there's there, there are better ways of uh, getting around that problem now. So in HTML5, there is now an async uh, attribute that you can put on a script that tells the browser, load this script asynchronously, run it whenever it's available. Don't delay the page loading. And if you want your HTML to be XML compliant to be uh, the XHTML dialect, then uh, you do that by saying async equals qu quote async because uh, in XML you can't just leave that attribute on its own there. Uh, but so this is the HTML5 version that's more common that you'll see. There's a similar one called defer, which means run this script when you've finished loading and parsing the page. So even if that script tag is at the top of the page, it will finish parsing the HTML before it tries to run the script. Uh, it won't wait for it. Uh, so there's a couple of kind of more recent um, attributes that can help with that. But those don't solve the whole problem. Um, because, well, we actually, we, we still need this JavaScript in order for our page to work. And so we've got this problem that every script element that we're introducing requires an HTTP request. And every byte of that script needs to be sent over the, over the network. And every character of the script needs to be parsed. And all of this is adding up to, to, to delays and latency. So there's a tension. As programmers, we would like to be writing and working with well-spaced, well-commented code. And we'd like it to be organized into files and directories, because if it was all put into just the one file, we'd find it very difficult to navigate, very difficult to work with. 
but the browser for performance wants no wasted characters and all in one file so it's as few HTTP requests as possible and as little data to transmit and as, as few characters for the JavaScript um, parser to parse before it can execute it. So there's a little bit of a tension there. Well, what if we could minify our JavaScript? So minifying is this term that we're, we're sort of introducing here. And the idea is that we can write our well-organized, well-commented code, and we can have some kind of build tool, concatenate all the different files together, and shrink them down before sending them to the browser, remove the things that the, that the browser doesn't really need. An old example, uh, JSMin by Douglas Crockford uh, around about 2001, um, it did comparatively little. It removed the comments from your code and it removed uh, unnecessary white space. And just doing those simple things, you could turn code from, here's one of his examples, so suppose there was this particular piece of JavaScript and you'd run it through JSMin and it would remove the comments, remove the white space and it would turn into that which looks a lot shorter, but also looks quite difficult to work with. As a programmer, I wouldn't want to be trying to edit that or debug that. So it's just as well that's something that's produced by the build tool, not the thing that we maintain manually. But we can do better than this. JS Min's only using some really simple strategies to minify its code. What are some other things we could do? Well, we could shorten the variable names and the parameter names. So long as we shorten them everywhere, it should still all work the same way. We could look for code that's in the file but isn't actually being called anywhere, um, stuff that's not being used. Or we could get really clever and we could kind of work out equivalent expressions. So th this is a little example I've put in here that uses De Morgan's rule from Boolean algebra, uh, that if you've got not A and not B and not C and not D, then that's equivalent to not A or B or C or D. But there's a caveat. That's only the case if those are Boolean expressions. It turns out that's not totally safe to do. So this one, sure enough, you could do this and there's a couple of characters shorter and some minifiers would apply this rule. Um, but it turns out that that's also a way that you can end up introducing bugs and security issues. Uh, so this just came up um, just the other day um, that uh, the example was using this, uh, this De Morgan's rule. And so the problem is that that conversion's correct if those are all booleans. But if you've got not false and one, then that in JavaScript returns the number one, whereas not false or not one returns true. So it's actually changed the behavior because this one wasn't a boolean. Um, and in this particular case, he's got kind of a longer example here where he's got some code that looks perfectly safe and it looks perfectly reasonable in the unminified form. It's checking a token's expiry, making sure that it hasn't expired. But when you run it through the minifier, when it comes out, um, the, the minified version will always return that the token's okay, even if it's expired. Uh, so you get a security bug introduced by via the minifier. Um, so we have to be a little bit careful about it, um, ab about the, the, the kinds of conversions that we do, but we can do all sorts of things. Taking this further, compilers can do all sorts of clever optimizations. And so we get this idea that perhaps we could take our JavaScript in lots of different files and we could give it to a compiler that will output shorter JavaScript. And the most famous example of this is probably the Google Clojure compiler. So this is from their homepage. The Google the Clojure compiler is a tool for making JavaScript download and run faster. It's a true compiler for JavaScript. Instead of compiling from a source language to machine code, it compiles from JavaScript to better JavaScript. It parses your JavaScript, analyzes it, removes dead code, and rewrites and minimizes what left, what's left. It also checks syntax, variable references, and types, and warns about um, common JavaScript pitfalls. And um, there's a handy little app that they've got which uh, shows this in action. And so here we've got a function hello uh, name that is going to do an uh, th 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 that's going to alert whatever parameter that we parse it and we can do it get it to do some simple um, optimizations and we run it and so sure enough in that case it um, 
it, it shrunk that parameter from being called name down to being called just a let's make the text a bit bigger there uh, so function hello name became function hello of a and it's removed the semicolon from the end there because it's not needed before the curly brace removed lots of white space um, so that's all fairly simple if we wanted to do something a bit more advanced and compiled it it would actually inline the function so in this case it's realized well this function you're only declaring it uh, you're only calling it once and you're calling it with this particular parameter so I could instead just take the text of that function and I could work out what hello plus this is and I could just call it directly and so there it is and um, well let, let's get it to do hello Alice and hello Bob and let's compile those and at this stage it still thinks no 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 that's short enough that I'm still going to inline it I'm just going to work those out and uh, do the the body of that code directly rather than treat it as a function uh, but if we maybe add a few more of those and then run the compiler it thinks about it a little bit longer um, but in this case it has actually kept it as a function and it shrunk the uh, the name even from hello just to a and the parameter is now called b and there is um, the function body and there's all the calls afterwards so it's kind of thinking quite hard about what what's the what's the best way to shrink this code um, okay so uh, let's in your play projects um, you're using play framework you're actually using play framework version 2.4 um, there's something curious with Play Framework 2.4, which is that they've actually recently moved away from the Clojure compiler uh, instead to two different plugins, uh, one called JS Hint for looking for problems in your, in your JavaScript code, and the other one called Uglify JS 2 uh, for doing the minification. Um, the odd thing about it is that in Play, this isn't in the Uglify plugin, it's actually in the require.js plugin. Um, so if I was to um, pop into so this is a the tutorial forms but I, I've I've edited it a little bit um, let's remove that one that's going to come up in the next video and so the the change I was making in this one was add to conf plugins dot sbt uh, this sbt r dot js and so whoops there's plugins dot sbt uh, sorry a project plugins dot sbt and add it in there I'll need to update that um, not that I'll need to update the slides because that should say project plugins.sbt um, but so you, if you add that in that will pick up the the plugin for doing um, the uglify and JS hint and the other thing you need to do is in build.sbt pipeline stages the production pipeline the processing to do to your JavaScript include this rjs require js task and that will also include the um, minification the uglification and so that down here in build.sbt uh, because i'm re-recording this video because of resolution issues uh, it's already in there but uh, let's let's paste that in and save it and so there, there we've now we've now put it into the build.sbt There's an extra little wrinkle in uh, play. So require.js and JS hint and uglify.js, these are tools that are actually also written in JavaScript. And um, they're written as node.js modules. If you want them to run faster, um, you need to set an environment variable. What this environment variable is going to do is it's going to tell SBT to run these using node.js instead of trying to interpret the JavaScript in Java. So the, the Java Virtual Machine, it's it's got two JavaScript uh, interpreters available to it. One is a very old one called Rhino that's really slow. The other one is a much more recent one called Nashorn, which is quite quick. But unfortunately, Nashorn doesn't expose some of the things that are needed to get the node.js modules to work and so that means that if SBT has to 
it, uh, run the JavaScript just on the JVM, it has to use this old Rhino interpreter and it's really, really slow. Uh, so instead we set this um, environment variable um, that passes this parameter to SBT that says, look, use for your JavaScript engine, use node.js because we've got it installed on Turing. And there's a link to, uh, this is the page in the um, play documentation uh, that says about setting up this require.js plugin and there's them saying about the export SBT ops setting the environment variable. Okay, but there's sort of a bit of a problem. If your code looks like this and let's do the little aside, where's that code come from? That code in fact has come from uh, my uh, accessory project which uh, and so I, I, I copied that code out of out of here and so this is the the compiled JavaScript code from it um, where did it come from in that case it didn't come from um, JavaScript in that case it came from some Scala code uh, so if I was to reopen my my Scala project in a new window uh, I could show you here, in fact, it's open. It's remember, it's opened it up. So this is loginviews.scala. This is Scala code that's being compiled to JavaScript, and some of this stuff is representing stuff that we want to um, to put into the HTML. So Scala is really quite different from JavaScript, um, but nonetheless, we can cross compile it and produce something that looks like that. That's JavaScript and interpretable. But there's but there's a problem. Um, because if your code looks like that, how on earth do you debug it? Um, you've got a bug in your code and you want to step through it or you want to inspect it in some way. How do you do it if your code is this, this horribly dense minified version? So there's an extra uh, concept that uh, was produced, that people came up with recently called a source map. The idea of source maps is that as well as getting the minifier to produce a minified version of your code, you also get it to produce a map from the locations and names in the compressed code back to locations and names in the original code. Um, so that when you initially open the browser, it just gets the minified code and it, uh, and it runs it and it's all nice and fast because it's all nice and minified. But if you open the debugger, the browser can spot this comment at the end of the minified source that says there's this source mapping URL and you can get a source map from here. And it can go and fetch this source map and then it can use the map to show you where you are in the original code even while it's executing the minified code. Uh, so let's show you an example. I'm not going to use the Scala for this because I don't happen to have a source map for this one. But if we do um, if we go view source on this page you'll see in here that I'm also using a script called jQuery and I'm using a minified version of it jQuery.min.js and there it is all looking rather rather ugly and um, unparsable but there at the end of it is a comment saying where a source map is and so if I go into the uh, into here uh, so this is in the debugger in the Firefox development tools. Uh, jQuery.min.js, it doesn't really want to show it to me. But if I go over to this settings and tick show original sources, it'll go and use that source map. And now it's saying it's, it's showing me the unminified version. And there it is with comments and everything all looking nice and readable. And if I wanted, I could put a breakpoint in there and I could... Uh, step through my code in the debugger even while it was executing the minified version. So this is the um, the rough idea of compile to JavaScript. Uh, you're going to see a couple of other ones. So you'll see CoffeeScript uh, in the next video and you'll also see JSX also compiling to JavaScript. Uh, in the, 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 the video about, about React.js. Um, I'd encourage you to uh, 
try some of these things out try out the closure compiler uh, but in the next two videos particularly uh, i'd encourage you to, to to try playing with the code um, and i will show you that in those